Welcome to AI Answers, weekly updates from the world's leading valuation authority. Today is October 7th, 2020. My name is Bill Garber, Director of Government and External Relations for the Appraisal Institute. Today, we are discussing the Appraisal of Real Estate, 15th edition, which was just updated and released by the Appraisal Institute. The Appraisal of Real Estate is the world's most recognized and authoritative text on real estate valuation. It is central to the body of knowledge that is curated by the Appraisal Institute on behalf of the appraisal profession. It is referenced every day by real estate valuation professionals, users of appraisal services, and government agencies and judicial systems throughout the world. The 15th edition is ever so timely for the real estate community, given the market changes occurring throughout the globe. I'm joined by three leaders of the Appraisal Institute who were integral to the release of the 15th edition. Jefferson L. Sherman, MAI, AIGRS, and 2020 president of the Appraisal Institute. Leslie P. Sellers, MAI, SRA, AIGRS, and chair of the Appraisal Institute's Body of Knowledge Committee. And Stephen D. Roach, MAI, SRA, AIGRS, vice chair of the Appraisal Institute's Education Committee and the Education Committee representative to the AI Body of Knowledge Committee. I'm gonna hand the baton to President Sherman, who will introduce us to the project and the immense work that went into this edition. Thank you, Jeff. Hey, thanks, Bill, I appreciate that. And you know, your comment there about being integral to the development of this book uh, probably excludes me. It's my honor to just be involved with uh, you, you folks that are really deeply into this. And as you see on the slide here, there were 48 designated members of the Appraisal Institute that made significant contributions to this book. And among them are the two gentlemen that are with me today, Leslie Sellers and Steve Roach, uh, as well as I'd like to mention Paula Konikoff. And all three of you folks really put such deep effort into this. It's, it's uh, humbling to me to see what you're willing to do to benefit the profession and the Appraisal Institute. And to that degree, I, I should mention that a couple of weeks ago, it was my honor to present the three of you with a President's Award for 2020 for your contributions and sacrifice. And in addition to that, uh, Bill, I was uh, thrilled to be able to present you also with a President's Award this year because of doing things like AI Answers and some of our other seminars that we've had online this year, really bringing a lot of value to membership in the Appraisal Institute. So thank you for that. We really appreciate it. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, some of our staff, uh, Stephanie Shea Joyce, Michael McKinley, Emily Ruzich, Michael Landis, Evan Williams, all had great contributions. And in addition, somebody that's worth a little special note is Stephanie Coleman, who's a, our Senior Manager of Ethics and Standards. Many of you know who Stephanie is, but you might not know that when the book was completed, she read it from cover to cover. So Stephanie, Stephanie is extraordinarily detailed and is a, also a tremendous, tremendous resource for us inside the Appraisal Institute and for the profession. So thank all of you for your contributions to the 15th edition. And I think uh, a really important statement that you'll find inside the book is this quote here, the Appraisal of Real Estate, 15th edition, peer reviewed by Appraisal Institute members is at the time of its publication, an authoritative source of recognized methods and techniques for valuation practitioners. This is uh, an extremely important, significant statement in the book. The recognized methods and techniques, you probably are remembering that this is part of USPAP, so we've got a lot of links here tied in, and it's a very important statement that's made in the book. Um, to that end, I'd like to go ahead now and and turn it over to Leslie Sellers, who will talk to us a little bit about body and knowledge. Leslie? Thank you, Jeff. The, uh, the body of knowledge is actually defined by the board of directors of the Appraisal Institute. The most recent motion was made in 2018, and it, it says that the current Appraisal Institute body of knowledge is comprised of the currently available textbooks, monographs, and guide notes 
that uh, are published by the organization, excluding compilations of uh, published articles. Uh, it also uh, includes the currently nationally developed Appraisal Institute courses and seminars. Uh, the current Appraisal Institute body of knowledge is an authoritative source of recognized methods and techniques. And as Jeff said, uh, this is a key statement because USPAP and other standards require that we as professionals follow recognized and accepted methods and techniques. And uh, this is uh, uh, this book is the premier um, version of our body of knowledge, and this is the most recent edition. So we encourage you to get a copy of it. Uh, to update any definitions or any statements or quotes in your reports so that you are uh, following the defined body of knowledge, which is the current edition. Next slide. The, the key thing that we want to make sure that everybody really understands is that this book, the 15th edition, doesn't change the body of knowledge. Most of the uh, changes were to do with clarification. Uh, the, uh, the process included a complete detailed review. This book was reviewed uh, extensively uh, compared to past and uh, we found some inconsistencies in wording, some um, uh, deficiencies in wording that were needed and we worked together as a with all 48 people uh, as well as uh, Stephanie Coleman to to make sure that the wording that we provided was clear for the practitioner or the user of the book. Leslie the uh, that's an excellent point I, one point that I'd like to make is how the body of knowledge of the Appraisal Institute is actually developed and uh, based on the, the board's motion, as you pointed out, the body of knowledge includes not only our currently available books, but our, but our courses and seminars. And so what ends up happening is we evolve the body of knowledge. We continue to explain and develop the body of knowledge, for example, as we might develop a course. But then it becomes appropriate to uh, harmonize that in with our textbook and to bring those materials uh, back into our textbook to make sure that we're being uh, fully consistent with our courses and seminars. So that's a that's a great point. And and to add to that, uh, the there's three areas that are uh, complete major changes for this book, and they are chapters that were pretty well rewritten, and they are uh, evidence of the exact situation that Steve is talking about, mm -hmm. where we already had another publication, we had courses out. And then we harmonized those courses or those publications with the newest edition of the appraisal of real estate. Hey, exactly. Wesley, Wesley, could I add a comment in here? Sure. So I, I'd like, you know, I think everybody listening uh, knows the value of this book. They know how they use it in their practice and uh, why it's important and then why our body of knowledge is important. But there's another kind of an unseen reason why the body of knowledge is so important to the Appraisal Institute, because it gives us standing. Because we're, we're the recognized leader in education and the curator of the body of knowledge, it, people come to us, government agencies, uh, congressmen, senators, a, a whole, a, Bill can attest to this, this puts us up front and it gives us the ability to represent you, our members, our candidates, our affiliates in the right way. And so the body of knowledge is really a huge thing for the valuation profession and especially for the Institute. Thanks. And not, not only in, in the US, but uh, internationally, the, uh, many members don't realize that this book is regularly translated into 11 different languages and it's used in master's degrees programs all across the world. Part of those programs are credentialed by the Appraisal Institute. So if you graduate from that master's degree program, you have either all or part of your MAI education completed. So uh, that's another good point to make about the book. I, I would agree completely. And I think, uh, frankly, I think the way we've approached it is this is a 
contribution to the public trust element of the profession. I mean, if that's a critical piece of what we do as professionals is support the public trust, I think curating the body of knowledge is a, a huge step in that direction. Uh, in, in regards to the book, there was a complete rewrite of four chapters on market analysis and highest and best use. That's chapters 15 through 18. And it doesn't change the way that we teach in our courses, and it doesn't change what we teach through our uh, market analysis and highest and best use book, which is now in its second edition. Um, if you recall, um, many members might not understand or, or remember this, but in 1988 or 89, uh, the federal uh, regulators came to the Appraisal Institute and said, we need some help. And as a result of that, it was developed in 89 and then put into our courses in about 1991 or 92, as I recall, was the stepped process of the interlinking between the market analysis and the highest and best use. And we've had it in our courses, we had it in our other book, but we had never really updated the appraisal of real estate to match completely with the step process. And for those of you out there that are uh, of a similar age to me, uh, the way that I was taught in college when I majored in real estate and in some of the earlier courses when I took it through the professional societies at that time, you know, we started with a top down. We started with a, a regional uh, population and income and all this sort of stuff. And then we'd move down, 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 and eventually end up with the subject property. But the stepped process goes the ex exact opposite. It starts with the subject property and moves out. And how does the market relate specifically to this property? Uh, so we matched the, the stepped process from our courses and our other publications and we, body of knowledge uh, uh, committee discussed it, and we decided to go completely with it, not to have an interim step. And I think it's a proper thing that we did. I agree with it. Uh, and we defined the link and the path from the property productivity analysis, which is the subject property and what uh, the productivity of it is. And we link it to the highest and best use with the market analysis. And uh, I think on the, is it the next slide? Yes, this is this is from um, the 15th edition, and this is the the roadmap, and it shows you these eight steps on the left hand side. Uh, it describes them in the middle, and on the right hand side, it gives you the link that w meets the uh, previous teachings of. I guess back in the 60s and 70s, where you started out with either physically possible or legally permissible, and then you went to the other uh, steps. But one of the things that if you you uh, you follow the eight-step process and you do it in this manner in your reports, the unique thing about this is that we don't see things like a definition of highest and best use and then a little paragraph saying it's uh, commercial or something like that. We are real estate economists uh, to some degree and demand and supply and delineating the market in which that property operates are critical elements uh, that are included in the step process and it helps the reader as well as the uh, professional doing the analysis to really do a proper analysis of how this property fits into the market it should sit in and what kind of uh, uh, attributes or detriments it has and those should all be considered. Uh, and at the last step, uh, step eight, which uh, we, we did this back in, in our courses in the early 1990s, but some appraisers uh, have not had that course and I recommend it highly the the new new version that you take it if you haven't had it uh, in several years we we don't actually say just the use but you're required to cover the timing and the market participants and there's a reason for that uh, those are critical elements of your conclusions for the highest and best use because it makes a decision for you uh, recognizing what approaches may be the most appropriate, 
uh, it, uh, one of the things I, I discuss when I'm teaching is uh, back when we had the credit crisis 10, 12 years ago, uh, we saw a lot of uh, appraisals that said for future development. Well, if development 15 years in the future after the current supply is, uh, is, uh, uh, is finished with, it may be that the current use is for some other use. And so that's one of the reasons that timing is so critical. And we don't see appraisers addressing that. And you need to understand that that's a requirement. Uh, analysis of the highest and best use is a requirement of USPAP and other standards. So um, this step process is, is this chart is directly copied from the book. And I encourage you to take that course uh, if uh, if you've not had it yet. It's, it's very interesting. I think well, they're really... Uh, Sorry, Jeff, I was going to say, I think the really exciting uh, thing about the rewrite here is that, that the text really does a great job of following this graphic of, of starting where Leslie said at the property level, at understanding the, the productivity of that property in the context of its market, working your way down through the, uh, the market analysis, the marketability analysis, studying the market and then using that to lead to the critical conclusions of highest and best use and the three elements that uh, Leslie described a few minutes ago. Sorry, Jeff, did you, you have a comment? No, no, that's okay. I, I was just going to get a little more specific and ask Leslie maybe or Steve, you guys to comment on in that step eight where we're looking at users of space. So how does step eight intertwine with, let's, let's take the two different types of users, an owner-occupied or an investment property. So how, how does this intertwine with that? Well, it's, it's really not about whether the property is currently owner-occupied. It's about what the highest and best use is. And uh, so you may have a property that is based on your supply and demand analysis and your delineation of the market it, it sits in and your definition of who is the market participant, who's the likely buyer. Those are the things that determine um, uh, such things as uh, what you're speaking of. And if the timing is now, and the most likely buyer would be an owner user market, if you had a market that was near equilibrium. But uh, if the property is best suited as an investment property, then the timing might still be now, uh, but most of the likely users or most likely buyers would be uh, different and have different considerations. And they would be looking at the lease up cost and the risk related to that. And not only is it the user, the most likely buyer, but it's also the timing. Because when you have markets that are moving away from equilibrium in either direction, uh, we're going to be talking later about uh, positive external uh, obsolescence. Uh, it can go both ways. It doesn't have to go just one. And we always think negative, but we can actually think positive. And the book has been updated uh, to give some more clarification on that issue as well. Well, so one thing that comes to mind as you're talking, Leslie, is when we get down to this last step, it really helps us make sure the comparables we're selecting are the right kind of comparables. They're like kind, either owner occupied or investment in this two scenario category. Yeah, the, the book says that, that uh, the proper comparables are the ones that have the same or similar highest and best use. And it, it doesn't mean that you can't not use exactly, but you need to consider the differences um, when you when you use ones that aren't matching. And one more point I want to make about this graphic, because many appraisers, for instance, uh, those that do simple uh, commercial properties or those that do uh, specifically residential. Um, this process is just like any other process. And if you read the scope of workbook, um, it, it covers this really well that Stephanie Coleman wrote. And that is that the, um, the amount to which you cover depends on the intended use, intended user, and it also depends on the complexity of the property or the complexity of the market. Do you have a market in equilibrium? 
do you have a house that you're appraising a 400 lot subdivision where they're all basically very similar in price uh, and I and I say when I'm teaching, you know, any idiot can step back from the curb and look across the street and down the street and figure out that the highest and best use is for what's on there. Uh, it's it's not that, but where appraisers miss it is when they have a market that's out of equilibrium, it's in change, and they don't recognize it, which comes to the timing issue as much as anything. Uh, the supply and demand up there are step threes and four. But uh, it also it can be uh, uh, a complex property where the improvement is not similar to what would be the ideal improvement. And so we need to recognize first, that's number one, recognize when we have an issue with the market or the property. And second, address it and go to more detail in the step process. I think one of the important follow-up comments on that, uh, Leslie, would be that there are properties that are inherently complex, and there are properties that are not necessarily inherently complex, but find themselves in a complex market or a complex situation. And so I, I completely agree with your comment about the amount of effort that needs to go into any one of these steps is a scope of work decision based on problem identification and figuring out exactly what the question is and where's the Where's the difficulty in, in that appraisal assignment, if there is any? Totally yeah. agree. Yeah, even with residential. I mean, if you've got a, a house that's a $20 million house and the market area that it sits in has the highest price in the last decade of three to four million, then you have a problem. And even in a residential appraisal, you would need to go to a much higher level of detail uh, in this the step process in order to do a competent uh, analysis. Agreed. And, you know, one of the other issues that we kind of talked about that, that came up is uh, most of the book was was written and kind of, you know, in the can, so to speak, uh, before COVID really dialed up uh, big time. But one of the issues that we kind of thought about is, well, how does how does this play into a situation where there's kind of a market disruption? So you want to comment on that, Leslie? Yeah, if you if you uh, if you have a market that has anything positive or negative out of equilibrium that's when you want to go to more detail analysis and so the the point i think that that needs to be made is no matter what the reason it can be code it can be a credit crisis financial credit crisis it can be a, a yellowstone a volcano blow it up i mean it can be anything but if you when you recognize that you have a major event, then you go to this step process. And if you do this step process in the proper amount of detail, according to the intended use, intended user, and the market that you're sitting in, uh, you will be able to account for any of these changes, positive or negative. Agreed. I, by the way, is is the Yellowstone on the calendar for what, November, December? I just need to know here in 2020. <laughs> Sometime okay. in the next 10,000 years, but it, oh, okay. they've, All right. All right. they've had Good several idea. little uh, earthquakes recently. I feel better. Um, the oh, oh, Sorry, was there anything else you wanted to mention on that one, uh, Leslie? No, I think we've uh, we've pretty well covered that one. Good. Um, the, uh, I th the, then one of the other issues, another real interesting one, uh, in, in my opinion, that we, uh, we spent some time on, is the the kind of the explanation of the concept of interim use again as was pointed out uh, earlier we didn't change the body of knowledge it's not like we rewrote the concept of, of interim use i just think there's a couple of areas where we did kind of a, a better job of, of clarifying um, one of the issues is we wanted to clarify that interim use is not a separate highest and best use but that as of a date of valuation it could be part of the highest and best use. In other words, we, we now clearly state that you could have a situation where um, on a data value, the highest and best use for that property is to devote it to an interim use for a specific period of time. And then as part of that highest and best use, looking prospectively to convert it to a different use uh, at some future date. 
The other issue that that uh, had been, um, I think, maybe read incorrectly uh, in the previous version of the book, or it had been some people had uh, read it incorrectly. Uh, we clarified that interim use can be part of the highest and best use for a couple reasons. Um, I think historically we've tended to focus on economic reasons. We, we've often said uh, we'll devote it to this use until it's economically feasible to devote it to some other use. But in many markets uh, across the country, uh, you could have a use that's currently economically feasible, but you just can't get entitlements to go ahead and devote it to that use. Uh, you know, some of the markets that I work in, coastal California, for example, uh, it could take five or 10 years to get uh, a property entitled. And even though it would be feasible, if you could do it, you can't do it. And therefore, you might end up with, a, with an interim use uh, situation in the meantime. So that was one we wanted to kind of kind of make sure we got we got cleaned up and and we did. Let's see. Leslie, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, this is uh, this is an edition in uh, the fifteenth edition, and and actually it's a a very proud edition. We spent some time with this example and tried to give the level of detail for the residential appraiser out there to clearly understand a good residential example for the sales comparison approach. Uh, we have the, the one page uh, shown, but this this example goes on for uh, what, three or four pages with uh, grids of both quantitative and qualitative analysis. And not only that, but it shows the mixture of the two and how you might handle uh, situations where you don't have enough data to handle it in a qualitative manner, uh, turning it into numbers, but you can handle it in a mixture of uh, the ones that you do have the ability and the data to do the quantitative analysis. You also can move to the second step, which is to account for those things that you don't have enough data for to, to go ahead and make a qualitative analysis. And this, this example is a, a big change for the book. And um, under uh, the leadership of the Appraisal Institute, uh, Jeff and the other officers, uh, they felt very strongly that it's, it's time for us to uh, get more involved in the everyday appraiser. And many of the profession uh, are active in a residential market. Uh, and I'm one of the, one of the uh, comments was that this is probably good for everybody, but specifically for those MAIs that are doing a residential property. Um, it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek comment that was made. Thanks, um, Leslie. The, the issue that we were trying to address here is, uh, among other things, was the, the proper application of a situation where the appraiser feels that there is adequate uh, information out there, as Leslie said, to develop some adjustments but not all of them. And um, let's see, actually, I think we're going to come back to, we're actually going to come back to that issue, um, I think a little bit. But the, the key idea here is uh, we very clearly state and describe a situation where you might be able to quantify adjustments, uh, say, for example, for things like um, uh, property rights conveyed or expenditures after sale or maybe market conditions or, or something like that. But you might not be able to mm -hmm. reliably quantify an adjustment for something like a view or quality or maybe location due to a lack of a sufficient amount of market data to do that. And so in this particular example, uh, as you read it, you'll see that this property has a lake view and a couple of the comps have a lake view, a couple of them don't. Uh, there's not enough reliable information to quantify that. And so in this example, that issue is handled uh, qualitatively. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a really good example to, uh, to, to point that out. And I'd, uh, I'd just like to say, Steve, if I could, I was gonna ask a question there, but you really answered it for me. But I think the ability to, to mix qualitative with quantitative really enriches the the uh, accuracy. I want I want to use the right term here. I'm gonna I'll let you correct me. I'd say credibility. Validity. Credibility Credibil is the word. Yeah, the credibility of the report because if you try to quantify something 
that is very difficult to quantify. Are you really uh, getting out on the ledge here a little bit? So it gives you the right tools. That's what this book is for. I was I was reading a court decision the other day, Jeff, and the, the court wrote that the appraiser attempted to quantify the unquantifiable. And and in, for that reason, I think the, the the court was having a little trouble with uh, with the analysis. And so I think maybe that particular analysis would have been actually enhanced by uh, a little bit of use of uh, some qualitative uh, presentation, some ranking, some of those kinds of things uh, that are described here in this example, as opposed to an attempt to to quantify it. Um, that, I think I think that's a great point. Um, Again, the key would be quantify what you can quantify, and if not, uh, qualitative is an option. Having said that, I do think we all have to be real careful about uh, about assignment conditions. You you may have a client that that has a requirement to quantify um, all adjustments, and uh, we would have to, uh, if, you know, if we decide to take on that assignment and believe we can do it credibly. Uh, then we would have to uh, comply with those assignment conditions. But uh, in terms of just general appraisal theory, I think we've been pretty clear here that there's inherently nothing wrong with uh, with a mixture of quantitative and qualitative. Yeah, well, one more point before we move on from this slide is this example, uh, although it is residential, it would apply to any analysis, commercial as well, in this regard. And that is that uh, appraisers need to understand that adjustments can be made throughout the report. Uh, you, you don't make it just on the sales comparison approach. You can make it in the reconciliation of the uh, one approach, and then you can make it uh, in the final reconciliation. There are different ways to do it, especially quantitatively, I mean qualitatively, um, in those reconciliations. And uh, so you've got more than one place to do it. That's the point. And that uh, that's a great point, and I think that's something that's commonly done, not only in the in the commercial world, but but also very commonly done in the in the residential world, where where appraisers look at a particular issue and there's just not enough data to quantify an impact, and and that's something that's discussed and and uh, presented and and considered in the in the reconciliation. That's a great point, Leslie. Uh, the next item that we wanted to talk about here was uh, was in chapter 22, which is ch that that chapter on uh, sales comparison approach. Um, we recognized a, a debate or kind of a disagreement over um, where you reflect the impact of below market rent on a, a, the sale, a, a comparable sale, or on a subject property. If you've got a, if you're valuing a subject property that's at market. And you want to use a comparable sale that's uh, that's got a lease that's that's above or below market. Uh, where do you put that? And and what we found is that a lot of practitioners would characterize that as a as a property rights adjustment, which is one of the uh, the cumulative adjustments, the multiplicative adjustments that we that we do first. And some consider it to be economic characteristics that are done after that particular series of adjustments is done. Um, we actually had a fascinating uh, discussion on this specific topic at the Body of Knowledge Committee meeting in Chicago uh, early, this, early this year. Um, and we, we quickly found out that, that within the committee, there was a significant disagreement with some folks saying uh, they do it one way and other folks uh, suggesting the other way was more correct. Um, Ultimately, the conclusion of that conversation and, and what's now presented in the book is it really doesn't matter. Um, just make sure that you adjust for any difference once, you adjust for it only once, and you make sure that any other adjustments that need to be made uh, rep reflect those specific adjustments. So uh, that was an interesting conversation, but ultimately the book says there is really no objectively correct or incorrect way to characterize that specific um, issue. Did you want to follow up on that, Leslie, or is that? Uh, yeah, is that I think good? you covered it well. It's it's regarding the, the property rights adjustment is made uh, at the top before you make your market conditions adjustment, and then the economic uh, characteristics adjustment is made after that. And the thought was that uh, you know it would make a significant difference. So we. We split up into projects uh, with some different members of the committee, and we made up some scenarios and tested it. Uh, 
And what we found that it, it really didn't make that measurable of difference. Uh, and, and I can tell you that, uh, best I recall, we spent close to a half a day discussing, and I would probably change the word to debate because uh, unfortunately <laughs> I, was, I was very passionate about my view um, and we had some members on the committee that completely disagreed with me. And so what we ended up doing was, was doing some tests and coming to the uh, consensus that we did, which is it really doesn't make that much difference so long as you don't double adjust. And that was the key. The key was make sure you adjust for it and do it only once. Yeah, that was the, that was the key conclusion. And, and uh, we ultimately realized that uh, this may be a distinction without a difference uh, on, on this particular issue. So that's anyway, that's now uh, kind of presented uh, in Chapter 22. We've kind of we kind of made that clear. Steve, uh, Steve and Leslie, let me, let me try to uh, put you on the spot or pin the tail on the donkey here a little bit. So let's <laughs> let's let's say uh, we do have a below market situation, whether it's subject or comp. But let me let make it a little more complex. So let's say it's a credit tenancy. And let's say there's an issue relative to the length of the lease that's involved that could potentially. So you've got three things involved. You get the rate appears to be below market. You got a credit influence, and you've also got uh, the length of the lease. So where do we put those adjustments in this new body of knowledge information that you're talking to me about today? That that's a great question. But as a as a predicate, I need to know: is Leslie the donkey, or am I the donkey? I don't know which one's the donkey. Uh, but I'll whoever I'll, brays I'll, first. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll take donkey role. Um, so you know, as an example, and, and that's a that's a great question because it does come up all the time for for appraisers. Um, let's let's do an example. Let's say for discussion that that I'm working in a in a market and I'm I'm appraising a a pharmacy building and it's the only one in the market area that's leased by a national credit tenant. Um, so that's that's my subject property. It's it's leased by that national credit tenant. And I go around and I find there's some sales of some other pharmacy buildings, but they're all leased to local tenants, local non-credit um, kinds of kinds of tenants. So so we know that we have to make an adjustment for that credit tenancy, assuming that we believe the market will, will respond to it. The, that is a perfect example of a difference that some practitioners would refer to uh, as a property rights adjustment, and they would make that adjustment up uh, above, the, above the line, so to speak, uh, early in the, in the adjustment process, while others would, would say, uh, nope, I've got a leased fee sale and I'm comparing it to a leased fee subject, and therefore, there is no difference in property rights. The difference must be related purely to economic characteristics. Now, other folks would say, nope, economic characteristics is where you put the difference in rent. The, the, uh, the other is property rights because of the credit tenancy. Uh, it all falls under this same umbrella where we're saying the bottom line is um, you have to make a supportable adjustment. You know, that's very clear. We're going we're gonna to talk about that. You adjust for the issue once and only once, and you make sure that all other adjustments that you make are consistent. So, you know, it's a great question. It's a, it's a perfect example. And I think ultimately the answer to your question, Jeff, is where do you want to put it? <laughs> because as long as you make the adjustment, you make it credibly and confidently, uh, the body of knowledge doesn't dictate where you put it. Thank you, Steve. I, I would add uh, something to that, Steve. Um, it really also depends on what uh, the intended use and user of your appraisal is. And in the example that uh, Steve's given, you're appraising the least fee interest. But what if you're being asked to appraise the fee simple interest in that same property? That can really complicate it. Uh, now, in the Appraisal Institute body of knowledge, the lease would not exist because the definition is it's available to be leased. So if it's available to be leased, that credit tenant would not be in place. Uh, however, uh, in all fairness, the uh, that relates to the Appraisal Institute body of knowledge. Now, if you have a different definition of fee simple from a local law or regulation, then you're obligated to follow, follow that as well as an assignment condition. And so that even further complicates the issue, but that's 
Uh, it's actually covered in another document that we put out as an organization recently uh, in a letter format, which clarified the appraisal of uh, fee simple on a lease property. And that gets into, I think, uh, Jeff, if, if we answered your, your question, if we kind of moving into the next topic, which is what, what um, Leslie started to talk about, it's one of the real deep dives in the 15th edition of the appraisal real estate was it was a detailed review and and rewrite of issues involving property rights. You know those have been uh, widely discussed in the profession and and outside of the profession in law in the last uh, years. And so we wanted to really take a take a narrow look at that and and make sure that the the book was accurately expressing the the body of knowledge. Um, again, no change to the body of knowledge. Uh, but but for clarity, we wanted to make sure that we were matching uh, the the course material that we've got and the seminar seminar material uh, that we have. We did take a, a close look at covering um, the issue that Leslie mentioned a minute ago: the appraisal of real estate. Uh, uh, sorry, the appraisal of a fee simple interest in a leased property. Uh, the appraisal institute's body of knowledge is unambiguously is unambiguous. We'll show you some some quotes uh, from the book to make that really clear uh, here in a couple minutes, um, and kind of kind of spend some time on that issue. It would take us uh, hours just to cover, I think, the entire body of knowledge on that specific issue. Uh, we did expand the discussion of the use of leased fee sales for a fee simple valuation and vice versa. Um, we uh, expanded. The, the interaction of the discussion of the interaction between property rights, uh, who's the most likely buyer, what property rights are being valued, and how do you treat uh, or not treat lease up costs and risk and time of getting a property stabilized. And uh, one of the other things we did that I think that's, that was really, really great is uh, we, we did a better job of treating property rights in the context of the cost approach. Uh, the cost approach has always been uh, concluded to reach an opinion of the value of a fee simple unless it's adjusted to another interest, um, up or down. And um, that that is now uh, been presented, I think, much more succinctly, much more, uh, much more clearly. So again, a lot of effort on property rights, and uh, I think we have a much better match now with uh, with with our uh, with our course materials and our in our seminars. Um, the just a, a, a real quick comment on uh, bullet point number one here, the one about uh, the, the sub bullet point number one about uh, I'm sorry, number two about least fee comps for a fee simple. Um, I want to read one quote out of the book because I think it's it's pretty powerful. Uh, this is not new, by the way. It's been there before, and it says if the sale of a leased property, i.e., the least fee is to be used as a comparable sale in the valuation of another interest in real property, the comparable sale can only be used if reasonable and supportable market adjustments for the differences in real property rights can be made. Uh, what that clearly says is you can't go mixing least fee and fee simple unless you can make uh, a reasonable and supportable market adjustment for that, for that difference. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's a super important part uh, that that the discussion has been expanded and uh, and clarified. Here's a couple of quotes um, regarding property rights that that are straight out of the book. Some of these are not new, uh, some of them are new, but I think they're real important. Uh, when the fee simple interest is valued, the presumption is that the property is available to be leased at uh, market rates. Uh, that's a, a continuing statement that was in the, the 14th edition. It's been in past past editions. Uh, very very important. Um, another thing that we really spent some time on is the interaction between uh, leased fee, leasehold, and fee simple. And this uh, this paragraph sums it up. Uh, a bit, I won't read the whole thing, but the bottom line is you cannot assume that the sum of the parts equals the whole. Uh, the, the value of a of a leasehold plus the value of a leased fee could easily be more or less than 
the value of uh, a, a fee simple of all of the bundle of rights. And, and that's a, a, an issue that we've uh, expanded on in the, in the 15th edition. Um, another one that, that I think is pretty critical is this one. A, a lease never increases the market value of real property rights to the fee simple. Any potential value increment in excess of a fee simple estate is attributable to the particular lease contract. And even though the rights may legally run with the land, they constitute contract rather than real property rights. Jeff, I think this gets back to the question you asked um, about a you got a credit tenant in a in a market that's characterized mostly by local tenancies. Um, the, the question that, that appraisers run into a lot is how do I characterize that uh, that incremental value? Uh, we discussed a few minutes ago the fact that the adjustment needs to be made. What we didn't discuss was uh, what is that adjustment? What what is the the property right that you're actually adjusting for? And uh, this paragraph addresses that uh, to some extent. So, and just a quick comment. Um, it's been decades uh, before uh, or, or since our profession went to this second bullet point uh, theory, and that is that the whole bundle of rights represents the fee simple. Um, but when you separate into two partial interests by the use of a contract called a lease, you actually create and split that fee simple into two partial interests. One is leasehold, which is the tenant, and the lease fee, which is the landlord. Now, in some cases, when you have the property leased at above market, the partial interest of the lease fee can be worth more than the value of the fee simple because the fee simple is to assume, as it says in the first bullet point, market rates. But if you have it at least above market rates, then the partial interest can be worth more. It's got less than the bundle of rights, but the value is more. And that's where you get into uh, some, some uh, pretty hairy situations as an analyst. Uh, and if you look at especially the, the development of the commercial real estate market, uh, in the triple net lease market, uh, where the uh, the full faith and credit of the company that is leasing the property is guaranteeing that lease, it can really um, increase the amount that they can obtain. And uh, those people are looking at the the view of that real estate as rather than a piece of real estate worth X, it's looking at it as a a, a source, a place from which them, if they conduct their business. And I it's a whole different way of looking at it. Sorry, Leslie. I think uh, an important follow on to that is you mentioned that the least fee interest can be worth more than the, than the fee simple uh, if you've got above market rent. But I think it's also just as critical in understanding, but less intuitive that the least fee can be worth more uh, than the fee simple, even if the rent is below market. And that sounds like a really funny thing to say, but if you've got a long-term lease to a credit tenant, the market might pay a premium for that property, even if the rent is below market, because the impact of the credit strength more than offsets the fact that the rent might be a little bit below market, right? So, Very good point. Yeah, and, I, and that's just a critical understanding that we've evolved in terms of the whole property rights discussion in the in the 15th edition so so really important to look at um, those partial interests as leslie correctly described those partial interests of a fee, of a leased fee or a lease hold to look at them independently if you're valuing them and not look at them as the complement of the other one in the fee simple right in, in other words don't assume that just because i've got a lease that's um, that's below market the, the least V is necessarily worth less because there's a positive leasehold. That's not how the market, the real estate markets uh, work necessarily. And, uh, and I think the book has done a, a really good job of kind of expanding on, on that thought that has been part of the body of knowledge for a long time, as you said. Good, good point. Uh, Leslie, you want to talk about the entrepreneurial yeah, well incentive? One of the things that uh, that we've noticed in the use of practitioners 
and their cost approach is uh, the, uh, the, the 14th edition had some wording in there that wasn't apparently clear enough. And uh, Nelson Bowles' book, In Defense of the Cost Approach, uh, he wrote for the Appraisal Institute before he passed on. Um, if you knew Nelson, you knew he was a very straightforward individual. And he said what he meant, and he said it in few words. Um, God bless his soul. But he he blatantly covered it clearly. And one of the things that we looked at was let's match the appraisal of real estate with the thoughts that um, he had in his book, which is also part of our body of knowledge. And and the way that, that Nelson put it is uh, the entrepreneurial incentive is as much of the cost of the construction of a, a building as the sticks and bricks and dirt are. And um, the, so we, we went through the, the, the text and clarified some wording. We added some things uh, for clarification in a few places. And then we came back and we, we clarified it because what we're seeing, especially in, in uh, property tax cases, where the appraiser is saying, well, this is an owner-occupied building, so there's no entrepreneurial incentive to be included. So then they turn around and depreciate. Well, if you depreciate a lower number, then you're going to come up with an even lower number than what you otherwise would. Uh, but in recognition of, of what they may have been meaning when they said that was that they built the wrong property on uh, wrong building on the property or that the market has is the wrong market for that property. So in recognition of that, uh, we added the clarification in there that yes, the entrepreneurial incentive is the first thing to go away as a part of depreciation if the market or the property has been built in the wrong place or in the wrong manner. If it doesn't match uh, what the uh, market and the legal demands are, uh, which is called the ideal improvement, then you definitely are going to be losing that first as a part of your depreciation. So we tried to bring it uh, to clarity, and I think we did a really good job of that. I agree. I agree. A um, couple of other things in the cost approach uh, in, in the depreciation world. Uh, we clarified some subtleties regarding the concepts of useful life and total economic life. Um, we added some clarification on, uh, on functional obsolescence, again, Leslie mentioned the book in defense of the cost approach, great book, also fun to read, uh, which is funny to say about a cost approach book, but it truly is. Uh, and then um, another issue that, that we clarified is the possibility of uh, the impact of positive external influences on the depreciation uh, estimate. Uh, we, uh, it's always been understood that uh, depreciation actually can go the other direction. It's always been understood that positive externalities can actually increase the contributory value of improvements more than their cost of replacement, which sounds pretty funny and sounds contrary to our basic understanding of the concept of depreciation. Uh, but by way of a real quick example, I worked on the appraisal of a property in Beverly Hills a, a couple of years ago, uh, Beverly Hills, California, and it was very clear from, from sales information that the value of that property significantly exceeded the value of the land plus the value of the, uh, the replacement cost new. And the, the reason was externalities. The reason was it would take a very long time and it would be very expensive to be able to get the entitlements to build the building and those external influences uh, actually offset any uh, other forms of depreciation that were in place. And so that issue of positive external influences and, and how it interacts with depreciation uh, has been presented a little more clearly in the, in the book. Um, sorry, my apologies. Chapter 34 on review, uh, that was updated to to better match our review theory courses. Uh, frankly, if you haven't taken our, our uh, residential review theory and uh, review theory general courses, I, I would strongly uh, recommend you taking them. I think they're outstanding. Um, and we clarified that if you express an opinion about any part of the work of an another, uh, of another 
uh, appraiser, that's a that's a review. Uh, so the, those were some relatively minor adjustments, I think, to Chapter 34. Uh, we updated Chapter 36 a little bit to cover three issues: uh, current accounting treatment of leases, uh, treatment of business combinations, and purchase price allocations. Uh, and then, uh, Leslie, you want to you want to chat about uh, chat? Oops, excuse me, about Chapter 37. Yes, uh, Chapter 37 has been um, expanded considerably with um, uh, examples for those appraisers that are getting into uh, the going concern uh, type of uh, property. And this was a new chapter in the 14th edition. And in the 15th, we, uh, as we did with the highest best use of market analysis, we matched this chapter to our course, which is the fundamentals of separation of real property, personal property, and intangible business assets. We included uh, very good examples uh, for the new appraiser to see how you structure the income statements for these types of properties, which is different than it would be in a normal income approach for uh, a, a regular property. And uh, it also goes through in a certain manner, similar to the course, it goes through all the methods that are used without giving uh, any judgment. It says that uh, this is used, the people that are against it say this, the people that are for it say this, and it's up to the professional to make the decision which one. But uh, what we have now for this chapter is what uh, I personally wanted for the 14th, but the 14th was a good introduction, and now we've taken it to the next level. I think the key... matches our body of knowledge. Sorry, Leslie. I think the key idea here is the, the idea of uh, problem identification. What is it that you're being asked to value? Are you, be, are you being asked to value the total assets of a business? Are you being asked to value the real estate component of a property that uh, commonly sells with non-realty assets such as personal property or, um, or, or intangible business uh, assets? And um, the, the, the chapter, I think, does a really good job of kind of getting into that. There's a couple of new graphics in the chapter, I think, that highlight kind of um, the, the presentation a little bit. Um, one of them on the left um, characterizes the types of assets that we might see between real personal and financial assets, noting that that uh, personal property can be either tangible, uh, like a piece of machinery or intangible, uh, like, a, like a contract. And then another way to look at it would be to characterize uh, properties between tangible, intangible and financial assets with tangible being broken down between real and personal. So there's a number of different ways you can look at the uh, look at the issue, but uh, this was one of the graphics that we presented to kind of um, explain the issue. And then uh, this is an, another version of the same kind of a concept expanded a little bit. Uh, this is uh, a graphic that matches uh, pretty well the, the, the uh, version of this graphic that you'd find in that separating. Uh, real property from personal property and, and uh, intangible assets course that Leslie uh, mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Leslie, did you, did you have any other comments on these on these uh, graphics? No, I think uh, in general, this chapter is uh, a good read and um, I recommend it for those appraisers that are thinking about getting into that. Uh, if you are thinking about getting into it, I also recommend you take that course. It is a very interesting two-day course. I would certainly agree with that, and I think that takes us here. Guys, thanks very much for all of your work this afternoon and in relation to the project. Um, real quick, the appraisal of real estate is not published on a calendar basis of any kind. I think the last one was published in 2013. Is that correct? So we yes. will have this with us for the next several years as uh, we digest all of the great information that's within it. The Appraisal of Real Estate 15th edition can be published by Appraisal Institute Professionals off the Appraisal Institute website. It's $110 for Appraisal Institute Professionals and $140 for non-members. Um, it is available in hard copy and PDF version. Uh, present. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm going to give a shout out. I, I got to do it. I'm going to give a shout out for the PDF version. Uh, highly re re recommend folks to get 
the PDF. It's a searchable PDF. You want to look for keywords or key concepts. I must open that thing and search it five five times a week or more. It's it's just a huge uh, addition to the functionality of the book. So sorry for the interruption, but but uh, buy the PDF. Bill, I have a, a shameless advertisement to make. Not really, but so if you're involved in doing testimony, you're doing any kind of litigation work, think about buying a couple extra sets of these books and conveying those to your best attorney clients. They will it will really elevate you, and it, it, a great thing to do. Um, they'll appreciate it. Like Steve says, the PDF is the way to go. Uh, you may give them both package because a lot of people like the hard book, but having the PDF that's searchable for attorneys is especially valuable. Any other concluding thoughts, guys? I agree. <laughs> no, thank you. you guys again. I can't thank you enough for all your work and the whole committee uh, on both sides, Education BOK, okay, the 48 people, the staff again. What a tremendous job. Thank you so much. Thanks for the Thank opportunity you. to join you guys today. I appreciate it. Yeah, Same and here. thanks to all of our listeners for joining us on AI Answers. We will see you next week. Have a nice day.